Don't ask. Don't ask what just happened. Apparently, the people who are not here are more important than you. No, I'm just kidding. It has something to do with the resolution and the live streaming and stuff, so it works now. Excellent. Welcome. Welcome in here and the people on the live stream. You're finally here. <clears throat> Welcome to Chain Nation. I'm not sure if you've ever been here. It's my first time. Great conference. Love it. I, my name is Chris. I work for a tiny little company that you might know. And my first question, and it's probably the most important question of the day, is who in here has a Twitter account? Oh, a lot of people. Excellent. There's a group back there. You guys are friends. You don't have one? You, you're liking each other's Instagram posts? Yeah, that's what you guys do. Um, so if you're going... And I'm encouraging you to tweet about this event, right? We just heard this is being live streamed, and I'm sure they're recording it as well, and the recordings will be out on YouTube later or whatever. So tweet about the sessions you like so that other people can, you know, know which ones are worth watching and then watch them later, and or more people come next year, right, to make this an even better event. Maybe we'll do it two, year, two days or I don't know what. If you go into tweet about my talk, please add that hashtag TwitterVM team, because Twitter actually has a VM team. So we're a bunch of people, about eight people now, and we have three GC engineers, and so you know they do all the GC stuff. Everyone has GC issues, so they take care of that, mostly support. Uh, then I'm a compiler engineer. I do the cool stuff, right? Especially by coming here and telling you about the cool stuff we're doing at Twitter. Then we have some people doing some infrastructure work. We have our own JDK. So you know, we merge in open JDK and things like this. Um, and then <coughs> we had, we just lost her, unfortunately, but we had a person working on a tool called Autotune. And Autotune is the thing I'm going to talk about today. So tweet about this. If you don't know me, I'm working on the JVMs for a long time. And all these 14 or 15 years now, um, I'm working on JIT compilers. So I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions because I don't know what you know. Raise your hands, really. Do people know what a JVM is? I would assume pe most would. OK. You know Hotspot, the JVM of OpenJDK? OK. Who knows what a JIT compiler is? All right, a few people. So I'm going to explain that real quick. Um, if you compile Java or Scala or Kotlin into Java bytecode, right, the way the JVM in runs that code is it loads the, file, the class files, interprets it, which is really slow, and then we have compilers in the JVM uh, that compile the Java bytecode into native code on the fly while you're running your application just in time. Okay, so these are the JIT compilers. And you know that's vice versa to an AUT compiler, which is ahead of time compilation. Something like GCC, right? You compile something ahead of time, get an executable, and then you run that all the time. JIT compilation, so Hotspot has two JIT compilers. One is called C1, or client compiler, and the other one is called C2, or server compiler. You might have heard that before, client and server. Maybe the old guys in the audience remember that, dash client, dash server, that we used to use years and years back. Don't do that anymore. Um, so C1 and C2 are written in C++. Right? Graal, on the other hand, is written in Java. Right? I think I'm going to talk about C1 and C2 a little bit later as well. So. <clears throat> I used to work for Sun and Oracle in the, in the Java platform group in the Hotspot compiler team, so I was mostly working on C2. No, let me explain it now. So C1 is a high-throughput compiler. So the purpose of C1 is to get away from interpreting code as quickly as we can and run on native code, so it doesn't do, C1 doesn't do a lot of optimizations. We just want to get away from interpreting code. And C2 is a highly optimizing compiler. So it produces the peak performance code that you then eventually run on, all right? So I used to work on C2. And C2 is a pain in the ass. It's very old, and you know I, I, I'll rant about it a little later. And so it was a lot of fun. These three projects were kind of the biggest ones that I worked on during my time at Sun and Oracle. JSR 292, Invoke Dynamic. Some people might know it. If you're using Lambdas, Java 8 Lambdas, you're actually using Invoke Dynamic under the hood. You just don't know. That's how it's implemented. Um, the implementation of JSR 292, we did, there were two implementations. The first one was a lot of handwritten assembly code, like 
pages and pages of assembly code that was very hard to maintain. Uh, we had to port it to all the architectures that we supported. It's a major pain in the ass. And then on top of it, we had a performance issue. So we redesigned the whole thing and rewrote it and moved all the logic that was in the JVM as handwritten assembly code into Java, into a package called Java Lang Invoke. And a lot of that Java code in that package I wrote. So if it doesn't work, you could technically blame me. But I always say the code I wrote was fine, and the people who touched it after me, they broke it. Yeah. So chap 243, Java level JVM compiler interface. We introduced that interface in uh, JDK 9. And so Graal, as I said, is written in Java, right? So there needs to be an interface that the Java part can talk to the VM part, which is written in C++. So there's a lot of native uh, interface code, but also a real Java API. And we extracted that interface that Graal was using to talk to Hotspot and put it in a module in the JDK 9 module. And now we have that interface, and it's kind of stable-ish. It's not an official you know, API, but it hasn't changed a lot. So in JDK 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, you basically have the same interface, and you can plug in, if you compile a Graal version, you can use it with all of the different JDKs, which is very useful to you know, do development work and whatever research. And CHEP 243, we did because of CHEP 295. And CHEP 295, ahead of time compilation, that's not native image. So maybe, I, yeah, I should also say this. I'm not going to talk about Graal VM, right? Graal VM is a very unfortunate marketing term that Oracle Labs chose because Graal VM means three different technologies. If someone later comes up to me, maybe, you know, tonight at the party when you already had two beers, and then you say, oh, I run my stuff on Graal VM. My question will then be, what do you mean? Right? Because GraalVM consists of three different technologies. There's a core technology called Graal, the chit compiler. Who knows what a chit compiler is? I've explained it. All the hands should go up. Um, so the chit compiler. Then there's something called Truffle, which is a framework to implement language runtimes. And then there's something called Substrate VM, which you might know as native image. So these are very different things. And when I say Graal, and this talk, is only about the JIT compiler, nothing else. So ahead of time compilation is not native image. The, the, the main difference between the two is this is actually Java, and native image is a subset of Java. It's not really Java. So the way this works is a small command line utility um, that you pass in class files or char files, and then it loads in all the classes, all the methods, sends it off to Graal to compile it, and then spits out a shared library at the other end. And then Hotspot can pick up these shared libraries, and you're basically skipping the step of interpreting code. So this might help if you have a big application that runs a lot of different code. This might actually help your startup. So, but it's, it's very complicated to, to give you a performance improvement just because the highly dynamic nature of Java the language. All right. And now, yeah, most importantly, I work for the best company on the planet. You should tweet that I said that. This is Twitter. That's what it looks like. Hundreds and hundreds of microservices. And then we have thousands of instances of these microservices. And on top of it, we run on heterogeneous hardware. Right? We own our own data centers. We own our own hardware, so we know what machines we are running on. But even we don't have one, you know, many of the same machine type. You guys probably run in the cloud. You don't even know what you're running on, right? So this is, this is one issue. And this is, by the way, from 2016. So by now, this probably has grown a little bit. In general, performance optimization is the way it works is you sit at work, and you are annoyed by the performance of something, right? And then you think, OK, fuck it. I'm going to tune this now. And then you tune it a little bit. and and then you're happy. And that happens every three years, five years, never, right? It's a problem because hand tuning doesn't scale, right? So you can only tune a few parameters, and then it's very time consuming and labor intense and error prone on top of it. And then the most important thing is that upgrades make optimality fleeting. 
You know, we all live in this agile world and deploying multiple times a day is the cool shit to do. Um, we deploy not multiple times a day, but we have some services that we deploy multiple times a week. So the code is constantly changing, right? So you tune today for the code today, but it's different tomorrow, right? So many services operate be opt below optimality. And that's certainly true for Twitter services, right? We're in the same boat, right? We have the same issue um, until we have that auto tune thing actually really working fully in production. So this is a little bit of theoretical part, what performance really is, uh, performance tuning is. So what are, you, what are you trying to do? You have a function defined over the main X, and then what you want to find is a configuration that maximizes F, whatever F is, right? F could be throughput or reduce latency or, you know, whatever you want to do. And very important, you're always subject to some constraints. And the number one most important constraint is it still has to work. And you will see later when the machine learning tool basically tunes it that we can tune too far so it's actually not working anymore. Well, that will happen. All right. There's performance tuning, right? You sitting on a Friday afternoon in the office, that's you. You pick a parameter, then you run whatever you're trying to tune, right? You measure your F. And then you get the value of the, of the outcome of your F, and then you, as a person, have to decide if what the, the value you just got is better or worse than before. Right? It's ridiculous. You cost a lot of money. I mean, it would, maybe we can get a monkey to do it, but what we really want is a black box. We, we don't care what that is, really. The only answer we need is, is it better than before or not? That's all. So for this black box thing, what we are using is something called Bayesian optimization. And it's a method to learn potentially noisy objective functions iteratively efficiently. That's important because we want an answer quickly. Right? We can't wait months and months to get an answer. We would like an answer today or in a few days, let's say. Because as I said, the code is constantly changing. You can't you know, run this experiment forever because then your data is not really valid. It finds new optimum few iterations, works well with nonlinear high, uh, multimodal high dimensional functions. That's important, the last part. Because the JVM has hundreds of parameters you could tune. After giving this presentation somewhere, um, a guy asked, so could I also tune my database? Well, of course you can, right? You can tune anything you want. You tune your Minecraft, or I don't care. So if you want to know more about Bayesian optimization, uh, my colleague Rumpke, he, he, he understands all this. I'm just pretending. Um, so he has also a very soothing voice, much better than mine, so you want to watch that on YouTube. He gave a presentation about two years ago already at DevOx, and you see the slides that he's using. Uh, the only thing I did was I stole his slides. All right. And I've watched his talk, and now I'm explaining it to you. I just, this, is, this is very briefly, um, and I'm really not an expert in this, so if someone is in here who knows Bayesian optimization, don't ask questions. I, I'm just explaining it to you so that you will understand the data and the graphs you see later better. All right? Okay. So we have a parameter that affects performance, goes from negative 6 to 6, uh, then the y-axis is performance, higher is better, and we have three data points that are actual evaluation runs. So these are true results. And this is the actual performance curve, which we don't know, right? But the points are certainly on the curve, obviously. And then what Bayesian optimization does, it assumes a curve, right? With some uncertainty. And the blue part above the curve and below, that's the uncertainty. Where we actually have a data point, the uncertainty is zero because we know that's the value. So overlaid with the actual performance curve looks like this. It's not really you know, even close, but that doesn't matter. All right. So what it does then, Bayesian optimization, it puts in a line with the best result like this. And then the blue part above the red line is the bottom curve, the expected improvement. The more blue you have, the higher the expected improvement is. And then what Bayesian optimization does, it just picks the highest one and that's the next value you try, all right? So we'll pick that one, the highest one, this one. We get that result that was worse than before. Then we try the one over there, like this. 
All right, then we have that curved part. Uh, then we try the one on the left, looks like this. All right, then the one in the middle, that guy. And then we've exploited that space down here, right? We know, okay, this is what the curve looks like. And then we take the one here over here. That was a bad result. So we go to the very left, that one, also bad result. Then we try that one over here, that guy, then this one, this one, this one, and that's the global optimum. That's what it does. We exploited the whole space. You see the kind of the curve looks almost like the, the, the real one, and that's all it does. That's what you would be doing as well, but the machine can do it so much better and faster. All right, that's all. So we like Bayesian, Bayesian optimization because non-parametric, robust, extensible, the robust thing is battle-tested on many types of real-world high-impact problems. That's important because we need this to work, right? You, 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 you want to have something where you can trust the outcome is actually true. And so auto-tune, at this point in time, we are not there yet, obviously, and we, as I said, we just lost the engineer to work on the project. But our goal is to have auto-tune always on in production. We want our services to tune themselves all the time because, as I said, the code is changing, right? And, and so we want it to tune all the time. And at, at the very beginning, you saw the graph of the hundreds of microservices. Sure, you can tune one or two, but you can tune all of them, right? So it's impossible. We'd like this to be on all the time, and so it has to work. All right, that was the theoretical part, the boring part. Now we, we go to the experiments. <clears throat> So what is auto-tune? We have, and I, at every conference I would like, and I should put it in there as a hashtag actually, Boas. I want the hashtag Boas to be trending, so make it happen. It's Bayesian optimization as a service, basically. So we run this Bayesian optimization thing as a service inside of Twitter, and it's called Wetlab, and Wetlab is, an, is a company that Twitter acquired a couple years ago, but it's basically an enhancement of a framework called Spearmint. And Spearmint is still uh, publicly available open source on GitHub. So we can't open source Wetlab, unfortunately. There are some IP problems. But we could, in the future, when it's actually working, we could uh, open source Autotune, and then someone would have to make it work with Spearmint, and you could use it as well. And so the Bayesian optimization part is basically what I explained to you right now, right? That's all it does. And Autotune is basically only a driver to run experiments. You, know, you can think of it as a script that starts and stops instances and get your F measurement back. That's all it does. It's, it's a little more complicated than that, obviously. You know, it has to run in the data center. This is also a service, by the way. So it starts and stops, evaluation runs, and collects the data, and then talks to the Bayesian optimization to see what values of the parameters you're trying to tune Next. That's all. So what is Graal? We talked about this before. It's a Java virtual machine just-in-time compiler actively developed by Oracle Labs. There's an official open JDK project, but all of the work is done on GitHub now. Um, uses JVM CI, and it's written in Java. You know, I've, I've talked about this before. The, part of the fact that it's written in Java is not important for this talk, but if you are interested in trying Graal as a JIT compiler, you know, instead of C2 running your big applications, you should watch this talk. Um, it's how to use the new JVM check compiler in real life. And the reason is, as of today, and it will be different in the future, but as of today, you know, Graal is in open JDK since JDK 10. So if you're running on JDK 11, and I think everyone in this room is running on 11 in production, am I wrong? Yeah, exactly. So if we run on 8, don't worry about it. But if you do, then it would be very simple to try Graal. Um, there are two things you have to know. They're not really issues, but you just have to know because I'm sure you're going to run some performance experiments or look at you know, memory allocation rates, or I don't know. Graal is written in Java, and C2 is written in C++. The two things that are very different are, number one, Graal, we are not AOT compiling Graal yet. That will come in the future. So that means if you start your JVM, the compiler needs to compile itself, it's like a metacircular approach. Um, you got to know that. That takes a little bit of time, but not a lot. So when you watch this talk, you will see it, it's really 
you, you can forget about it. And then the other thing is you have to know is C2, when it does compilations, it allocates memory on the native heap with malloc, right? C++. Graal allocates on the Java heap. So you just have to know that, right? If you run a benchmark and suddenly there's more memory allocation happening you, and you know, oh, Graal is doing this, then you're fine. That's all. All right. Which parameters did I tune? So I picked three parameters, and all three parameters are inlining related. Who knows what inlining is? Few people. Okay. So if you have <coughs> uh, a piece of code that repeats itself in your source code, right? What you do is you refactor that into a small method that you call from all the places, right? This is nice for you, but for the runtime it's not. So what the compiler does is it undoes what you did. It takes the tiny little piece of code and puts it back. That's called inlining. And it's a very powerful optimization because what it does, it, inlining is called the mud of all optimizations. And the reason is, if you have a bigger compilation unit, your worldview is bigger. And then you can do more optimization on that, right? So inlining, you bring in more code, your graph gets bigger, you can do more optimization. And it goes hand in hand with another optimization called escape analysis. I'm not going to explain it too much, but escape analysis can get rid of object allocations when the compiler can prove you don't need it, right? So, and if your compilation unit gets bigger, you see more what happens with the objects, and then you can eliminate more, right? So I was tuning inlining parameters. One is called trivial inlining size, and its default value is 10, and it's 10 nodes in the compiler graph. So a compiler, any compiler, is parsing a source language, be it C++, or in our case, Java bytecode, and into a tree, right? And then the compiler does operations on the tree. If the method that we're trying to inline has less than 10 nodes in the graph, we just inline it all the time. And the reason is because we know it's trivial. We don't even need to look at profiling information or anything. Then maximum inline size is the other end of the spectrum. If it's more than 300 nodes, we don't inline it. And then the small compared low-level graph size is also 300. It's pretty much the same as the second one. The difference is um, the compiler, Graal, C2, and many other compilers have multiple levels of intermediate representation, multiple levels of compiler graphs. It's usually C2 and Graal, they have a high-level compiler graph and a low-level compiler graph. Uh, the difference is the high level is high and the low level is low. Yeah, that's how I explain things, right? To my colleagues, they think, well, what's wrong with you? Um, no. So the high-level one is closer to the source code, in our case, to Java bytecode. And the low-level graph is closer to the actual machine code for your architecture. So in our case, that would be x86 or something, right? So that, that's the difference. Um, but the same thing as the second one, more or less. So... <clears throat> I have a presentation, it's called Twitter's Quest for Holy Grail Runtime, where I basically tell the story of me working at Twitter for the first year and you know, telling you about um, all the bugs we found and the problems we had running stuff and how much money we are saving. So what I did in this talk was um, exactly what I told you earlier not to do. I hand-tuned it because I wanted to see if we can actually tune the compiler and get more performance out of it. So. I'm going to show you two slides from, from this other talk. This is the tweet service. It's 24 hours of tweets. And we're looking at GC cycles, right? And so one thing I just explained to you, inlining and escape analysis, so what we expected to see with Graal is less GC cycles because we are not allocating as much memory. And we get it, it is, I, have, I shouldn't have done this, it's so weird. The improvement, um, by just running on Graal instead of C2 is 2.7%. It's like the way I put it up there is really weird. But by hand tuning, I got another 1.5% out of it, which I thought was pretty cool. I was, I was doing this for three hours on a Friday afternoon, and I could reduce GC cycles by another 1.5% to a total of 4.2. So that was pretty cool. And then this is user CPU time. That's the one we care most about, because if we can reduce user CPU time, that means um, we, have, we can use less machines for the same amount of work, 
right? And if you have thousands and thousands of the machines, it's a lot of money. So just by running uh, on Graal instead of C2, the tweet service will reduce by 11% of CPU, which means we can surf the same amount of tweets, which is in the millions, hundreds of millions per day, with 11% less machines. And you see where the money's coming from. And by hand tuning, I got another 2%, which I thought is pretty cool. I was very proud of myself. I might even had a beer that night. I don't know. So, but you will see the 2% that autotune will kick my ass. I thought two is cool, but you know. So what ranges? I gave my parameters actual ranges, um, which is not necessary. You could also say, tune it from, and you give it ranges from one to one million, or I don't know, it doesn't matter, because you remember the way Bayesian optimization works, it would figure it out anyway, right? The reason why I gave it ranges is I needed this to finish in a certain amount of time, preferably 24 hours so that I could fit it on slides, right? I can't show you two months of data, that's impossible to understand. So I gave it ranges, and since I know that the, these, um, we're looking at two services, I know them really well, so I know what ranges make sense. Uh, so these are the ranges. The test setup, if you are doing performance um, uh, measurements, and you only expect uh, performance improvements in, in single-digit per percentage, you need dedicated machines. You can't, you can't just run it in your data center. All the cross-talking and the noise in the of your neighbors, you don't know what else is running on your machine. It will destroy everything, and all your results will be in the noise. So I have dedicated machines. All instances receive the exact same requests. Very important. It's not only the same number of requests, it's the exact same request, because in the case of the tweet service, for example, a tweet could be one character long or 280, right? And the memory allocation pattern for the two tweets would be very different. But we want to compare apples to apples, so they all receive the exact same data requests. And because I get that question a lot, it's live data, live requests. It's not, I'm not replaying anything, it's just the, when I run it now, whatever you guys tweet, that's basically the request I'm getting in. I run this JVMCR version, this Graal version, not important. Default tier C1 Graal setup. Who knows what tier compilation is? No one. All right. So you remember when I talked about C1 and C2? Right. So the way Hotspot does it, and other JVMs as well, is you, you start out running your code, interpreting in it. Right. Then we compile with C1, and we compile it in a way that it adds additional code to collect profiling data. Right? Then we run a little bit on the code, and then we recompile with C2 using the collective profiling information. And so we, we step through the tiers. You see that? And so basically, when you run Hotspot today, you run C1, C2 tiered. And so what we do, we just replace C1 in tier compilation with Graal. That's all. You can do that too, by the way. Very simple. OK, experiment one, tweet service. My favorite service, the tweet service is a Finagle thrift service. Finagle is one of these frameworks uh, that we use internally to build our services, and it's open source. You can get it on GitHub. Finagle is an extensible RPC system for the JVM used to constru construct high concurrency service. I don't even know what it is. I don't. But uh, I don't have to, right? So whatever, whatever runs on top of the JVM, I don't really care. Uh, we just try to make it run faster. The important thing on this slide is at the bottom left, it's 92% Scala code. So most of our services are written in Scala. We only have a handful that are written in Java, but everything else is in Scala. Uh, and our stack of one service is basically Netty, Finagle, and then the logic of whatever service it is. Good. So we need an objective. It's basically our F. And what we're trying to do, you see it at the end, it's user CPU time. So we are trying to reduce user CPU time. But if you remember, Bayesian optimization looks for a maxima, right? So since we're all uh, very smart computer science engineers and really good at math, we do one divided by. Amazing. And then we have constraints, as I said. I only used one constraint. We, sh we should be using many more constraints. Every service owner 
they have their own metrics they look at to make sure, you know, then they know oh, our service is actually running well. So we should be using all of these constraints they have. When we, as I said earlier, when we go into turn on Autotune in production for all the services, we have to do that, right? Because we, we can't monitor all the, service, the services. It's impossible. But in this particular case, I know the service really well. I was really monitoring it, if it's doing OK. So I was just using, um, we are running on Aurora, um, in, Mes in Aurora on Mesos. And Mesos has this thing where it says, oh, throttled. So when you're getting throttled, you're using too much CPU, you're doing stupid shit, and then it kicks you out. That's the only constraint I used. And that's the result. That's 24 hours of tweets, requests per second. We have in blue experiment and in orange the control. And as you can see, it's the same curve because they all received the same requests. And then you see these slices, they are 30 minute evaluation runs. So I chose 30 minute evaluation runs. Um, and I did only 30 minutes because, again, I wanted it to finish in a day so I can fit it on a slide. And I know the service well. I know that in 30 minutes everything's being compiled. It reaches a steady state, and it's all fine. If we have this, again, as I said, on for all the services at Twitter, 30 minutes is probably not enough, right? Because we don't know the other services, what they're doing. What the exact length of an evaluation run would be, I don't know. We would have to find out what a good value would be. OK, that's the result. That's user CPU time. Every time the blue line is below the orange one, that's an improvement. And the spikes you're seeing are the restarts of the JVM. And it's basically when the JVM compiles all the code. And then what Autotune gives you is basically a web page, a table. And this table is sorted by objective, and the top one is 1.0838. What that means is that we reduced user CPU time by 8.4%, which is great. You remember, 2% was very proud of myself. 8, mm, shit. So, and then we have a 8.1, a 6.4, a 6.4, a 5.8. So if we say maybe the first two are outliers, and then, but we could probably guess we get a 6.34-ish percent improvement. That's my guess. And then here you see the values that we found. And then the bottom of the table looks like that. And as you can actually see, three evaluation runs actually violated the constraint. So we tuned it too far, it didn't work anymore, it got kicked out. Um, and then you can see at the top, we can look at the charts. And these are the charts of the parameters that we tuned. So Take this with a grain of salt, because every data point in this chart depends on two other values that are not the same, right? We tune three parameters, so we're exploring a three-dimensional space, which would be very difficult to show on a slide. So, but it gives us an idea what's going on. And if you squint a little bit, you actually can see a trend that's going up, right? Default was 10. And if you look at how the curve goes up, it should probably be 21, 22, 23. And we, ours is 21, actually, right? The best one we found. This is maximum inline size. It's kind of flattish. It doesn't really affect performance. Um, there are two outliers at the top. But again, they might be outliers or not, because they depend on two other values. So maybe just that configuration was so much better. But we don't care, right? If that's a good result, if that's a good um, uh, configuration, we just use it. And this is the last one. Very obvious what's going on, right? So the default of this one was 300, but actually it should be more like 600, like twice as much. So very obvious what, what's going on with the performance here. OK, so what I did then was I wanted to see if what Autotune found could actually be reproduced in the real world. So I took the the top entry of, of, of the results of the table and started a tweet service instance and ran it for 24 hours, right? That's that. I'm comparing blue in C2, orange Graal, and then red is Graal with the values we just found. And you can see they all received the same exact requests. And then you've seen a similar graph before. That's GC cycles. And by just running on Graal instead of C2 for the tweet service, we can reduce GC cycles by 3.4% in this particular run, right? Slightly different to what you've seen before. Different code, different data, 
you know. 3.4, nice. 3.4, sure, it's not, you know, outrageously high. But remember, we're still doing the same amount of work. We just have 3.4% less GC cycles. And, and very important, GC cycles, or GC in general, uh, always affects your latency. Right? If you have less GCs, your latencies are better. Then this is auto-tune, and as you can see, it's certainly better, and it's another 3.5%, up to almost 7% improvement. So running on Graal for us gives us a nice improvement, but we are throwing out a lot of money out of the window if we don't tune it, because we tune the same amount as we get by default. And this is the same data, just in a different graph. Uh, maybe some people might understand this better. It's basically allocated bytes per tweet. Uh, and important here is it's basically flat across the day. Sure, there are some fluctuations in there. Again, different tweet length and whatever. But it's pretty much the same, right? And the improvements are also the same. 3.5, 3.4, 7, right? Same thing, same data. That's the one I care the most about, user CPU time. In this particular run, uh, we got a 12% improvement, which is amazing, right? But just turning on a command line switch and running on Graal instead of C2. And this is Autotune. And that's another 6.2, up to a total of 18. And you remember the table where I said, oh, the first two might be outliers and maybe we get a 6.4 improvement? We do, 6.2, which is great. 18%. So we can serve the whole world with 18% less machines. And believe me, it's a lot of money. I can tell you how much it is, but it's more than I get paid. I was trying to get actually a, a chunk of that money, but they are not giving it to me. I don't know why. So the, the, the other thing I looked at for the tweet service was P99 latencies. So the reason why I only look at two nines and not three or four is because if you look at three or four nines, you only look at your longest GC pause, right? But 99 gives you kind of a view of the real world, and it's 99% of the tweets anyway. So you can see Graal certainly is better than, than C2. Uh, it's a little hard to tell how much it is because it's, you know, it's going around. Um, we not only reduce CPU utilization by 18%, or 12 in that case here, but we also reduce P99 latencies. So it's... It's running faster in both, in both directions. Then this is Autotune, certainly better than Graal. Um, again, very hard to tell. So basically what I did, I integrated over the 24 hours. That looks like that. And then we can see at the very right how much the, the improvement really is. But just running on Graal instead of C2, we have 20% P99 latencies. 20%. Remember, imagine that. And then we tune it, and we get another 8. 28% lower P99 latencies. That means you get your tweet 28% faster. If you like scrolling really fast in your Twitter app, you could read 28% more tweets, which would be really cool if you would do that, to be honest. OK. So I did another experiment uh, with a service called Social Graph. And it's, again, a Finagle thrift service. Social Graph is an abstraction for managing many-to-many -many relationships at Twitter. It's basically who follows you, who are you following? That's what, the, what Social Graph is. The reason I picked this one is the, the bottom of the stack is the same, right? Netty, Finagle, just the logic on top is different. And I want you to see how that affects um, the improvements that we can see with, with Graal and Autotune. So again, same objective. You've seen this before. We're trying to reduce user CPU time. Same constraints. You have seen that before. It's boring. Uh, that's the run. 24 hours requests per second. Again, 30-minute evaluation runs. That's the result. Certainly improvement. Sometimes it's worse. And that's the table. So the best one is 7.6, which is nice. 7.6, really good. We have another 7.6, a 7.2, 6.8, 6.4. So maybe, maybe we get a 7% improvement if we're lucky. Um, we'll see. The bottom of the table, uh, again, one violated the constraint. There are uh, three still in progress. Don't ask me why. It's probably a bug. Um, and these are the charts. 
trivial inlining size, it's not as obvious maybe as with the tweet service, but there's certainly a tendency going on, right? Again, it should be more in the 22, 23 range, and with the tweet service, it was like 21 or something. This one has a slight tendency up, if you ask me, so there's something going on here with this, this service. The best one we found is at 400, whatever. And this one, not as obvious as with the tweet service, but again, uh, a tendency upwards. The thing to point out on this chart is the best one we found is almost 650. And if you remember, I'm not sure if you, if you paid attention, but my range was to 650. So maybe I have to rerun this um, with a higher range or no range to figure out if we can get more improvement here. All right, so I did the same thing. Uh, verification run, that's what it looks like. And this is the result. This is, again, GC cycles, and it's only 1.6%. But that's just the logic, whatever the code does, right? If, you, if the compiler can get rid of as many object allocations as with the tweet service, it's just less. And this is auto-tune, and as you can already see, this is twice as much as we get out of Graal by default. This is a very important uh, data point. Sure, 1.6% improvement, I'll take it, if I can get it for free. But if we tune it, we can get twice as much out of it than by default up to a total of 5%, and that's already a really nice number. So tuning, performance tuning is very, very important. So this is user CPU time, 5.5%. Again, different. These, this kind of correlates a little bit with the CPU, uh, with the GC reduction. Remember the GC reduction we had for Tweety Pie was four, three point something percent, and for the social graph was 1.6, and the imp CPU improvement was 12 and 5.5. It's kind of half, right? The GC reduction was half, and this is half. Because if we can't get rid of all the object allocations, we also can't reduce the CPU as much. Because the most CPU, if you can get rid of object allocations, you, the code you compile gets tighter, smaller, and so it runs faster. But more importantly, we don't have to collect the garbage. And garbage collection is very CPU intense and takes a lot of CPU cycles. So 5.5, this is auto-tune. Again, more than we get out by default, up to a total of 13. So performance tuning, very important. If you pay attention, and I hope you are, you will notice that the, if you look at the blue and the orange one, the improvement is the same. It doesn't matter if the load is low or the load is high. But for the auto-tune, result, it matters. It's more here than it's over there. And that shouldn't be the case. And I have, unfortunately, didn't have the time to look into this and why that's the case. But the 7.8 is certainly from up here, because I'm not stupid, right? I'm taking the best result, obviously. But there's also a reason for this, because we don't really care too much about the improvement when the load is low. It's only very important when the load is high, right? Because you have to size your instances for your highest load. Anyway, 30%, a lot of money. Questions? Everyone who paid attention should have this question. All right? This is actually an auto-tune talk. I talk a lot about Graal and how great it is. But did I do the same with C2? Well, yeah, of course I did. Right? I couldn't come up here and, and say Graal is the best compiler on the planet and then didn't, don't do the auto-tune experiment with C2. So let's look at that. I picked, again, three inlining-related parameters. I tried to pick some that are very similar to the ones that Graal has. The first one is called max inline level. The Graal doesn't have that. So max inline level is basically how deep you inline, how many call levels you inline. So very important to date, the value is 9, which we picked 15 years ago, maybe. I don't know. Um, in, in today's world, where everyone's using hundreds of different frameworks, right? Framework A is calling framework B and calling, calling, calling. But nine, it stops inlining. So you actually probably never inline the code that you wrote. This nine value that we picked a long time ago is certainly not enough today. Good. Then max inline size is exactly the, the one that we uh, had for Graal as well. The default value is 35. The, the main difference here is 
for Graal, it was, remember, 10 nodes in the graph. This is bytecode size, 35 bytecode size. If you ever wrote code or in whatever production and code, whatever you have, and you added a search statements to a small method, and suddenly your, your performance went to shit, it's because of this guy. Because if you add a search statements, it adds to your Java bytecode. And C2 doesn't discount for a search statements when it looks at a method for inlining. I know, I'm sorry. It's very embarrassing. We never fixed it. Use Graal. Um, inline small code, 2,000. That's a really odd one. It's 2,000 bytes of native code. So if you're looking at a method as an inlining candidate, method that you want to inline, and you already have compiled code for that method, and it's bigger than 2,000 bytes, we're not inlining it. It's really a, a little bit odd. There's, I can somewhat understand the rationale behind it, because 2,000 is quite big, right? So if we have big code for it, maybe we shouldn't be inlining it. But that's inlining can collapse a lot of things, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it would increase our size by 2,000. So it's, a, it's an odd one, but I tuned it anyway. Same thing, ranges. We don't need them, but I've explained it. Okay, that's the run. 24 hours. Tweet service again. We're looking at the tweet service. Um, that's the outcome, and not much to see here. That's the table. So the best one we have is 5.1. And then we have a 3.8, a 3.5, a 3.3, and a 3. So what we've seen with the tweet service with Graal, the first two were outliers. So let's say the 5 is an outlier. And then we could say, well, maybe with C2 we could get a 3.5 improvement, 3.5%, which is nice, right? It's a, it's a compiler that's been around for a very, very long time. Um, and it, it has been tuned forever in the JVM, but if we tune it for our particular code, for our service, we can get another 3.5% out of it, which I totally take. It's still more than I was hand-tuning myself. The bottom of the table looks like that. No constraints violated in this particular run. That's cool. Let's look at the charts. This one is very obvious what the hell is going on. Right? It's the max inline level thing that I was talking about, how deep you inline. Default is 9. I actually went down to 5 because I wanted to see how bad performance goes. Um, it should certainly be higher, like 16, 17, 18. So almost twice as much. And I would argue that for today's code, it should be that value. Because the code that we've written 10 years ago is certainly very, very different than the code we're writing today. This is max inline size. Kind of surprised me a little bit that it's doesn't affect performance at all. It's completely flat. We have this one outlier, which is our best result, but everything, it doesn't, you know, the, the other max inline size at, for Graal affected performance a lot. But here, not really. And this is inline small code. That didn't surprise me too much um, because it's that weird one, right? So again, like a flat curve. OK, that was it. I didn't do a verification run for for C2, but you know, let's assume, let's be nice to C2, and let's say we get a 4% improvement, which is still cool, but compared to what we get out of Graal, it's basically nothing, right? With Graal, we already get a 12% improvement, and then another 6 so that kind of, the 4%, it's not so good. Uh, this is the summary of my talk. Um, I use the same summary for all of my talks, and the, and the reason for this is because I want you to try Graal, right? I know this is an auto-tune talk, and it's about machine learning, but I want you to try Graal, and this is all you have to do if you run on JDK 10 or later. If you run on 8, you can download a Graal VM community edition, for example, right? And then you have Graal by default. Uh, you can also download the Enterprise Edition. I'm not saying you can't. I just want to point out if you download the Enterprise Edition, you have to pay for it if you use it in production. I'm not saying you shouldn't be paying. Pay for it if you want it, but don't use it in production because I don't want Oracle to sue you. <laughs> so they are slightly bigger than you are, so they'll sue your ass off. Um, we at Twitter, as you've seen, um, 
with the tweet service, the social graph service, we get a lot of improvement out of Graal. That means we save a lot of money. And we, have, we are not even running all of our services on Graal yet. That's the next step. And then the improvement will be much, much better. The reason why I want you to try Graal is because multiple reasons. Um, number one, I'm a very nice person. I want you to save money too. And then next year when I come back, you say, oh my God, we saved so much money. I'll buy you two beers and you can sleep at my house. That's what I'm hoping for. So, yeah, just kidding. Um, but with the money saving part, I'm not kidding. If you can save money, fucking save it, right? The, sure, we save a lot because of our, of our scale, but if you have a company where um, compute, your, your business is online, right? You pay for compute. Your compute expenses are usually a fraction of your revenue, right? Same for us. And that's always good. If you, if you spend $10,000 a year for compute and you can save $1,000, that would be great, right? Would be an amazing Christmas party, $1,000. Invite me, by the way. Um, so that would be cool. Then, the, that's the, actually the most important part, why I want you to try it. I want you to find bugs, right? We found bugs when we started running Twitter services on Graal, and you, you'll see all the bugs we found explained in my other talk in the Twitter's quest for Holy Graal runtime, if you're interested in that. Oracle Labs is running spec GBB. You know, they can only run it so many times. They're not finding a new bug anymore. And the tests we're running, we're not finding new bugs anymore. We haven't found a bug in Graal in over two years, right? We, by the way, we are running Many of our biggest services, like the Tweet Service, Social Graph Service, User Service, plus about 20 others, 100% on Graal in production for two years now. So all the tweets you've seen in the last two years and the tweets you've sent were actually uh, went through code compiled by Graal. Did you lose any tweets? I did not. You, you wouldn't even know if you lost one, but you, you did not. Um, fine, we never had a problem in production, never. So what we need is other people to try it as well, to find the bugs that we haven't found. And the best way to do it is if you run your shitty production code on Graal. Because it's that old, crafty code, right, that has weird code shapes that we need to throw at the compiler to find these bugs. Um, so please, please, please um, try it. The reason I want this is I would like Graal to become the default compiler in OpenJDK. And Oracle is a very conservative company. You know, granted that there is a reason for it because the whole world basically runs on Java, right? Your, the, the money you have and the stocks you own are basically in a bank account managed by Java code, right? So it's all, it's all Java, or at least runs on a JVM. Maybe it's Kotlin today, I don't know. But, um, so they have to be a little conservative, I understand. But the improvements, C2 is a very old compiler, as I said. And as you could see with Autotune, it's a very powerful tool, but the improvements we can get out of, of, uh, of C2 are so much lower than we c what we can get out of Graal because it's just a newer compiler and there are many, many more ways to to improve code more. A colleague of mine, Flavio, he is not really a compiler person, but he is a Scala person, so he knows Scala really well. And he's writing Scala-specific optimizations for Graal. And the improvements, uh, two of them are already upstreamed. Um, so the improvements we are seeing are outrageous. Because if you... so. C2, and I've worked at Sun and Oracle for many, many years on C2, not for one day, for one hour, or one minute did we ever optimize for any other language than Java, right? So if you run on Scala, or Kotlin, or Clojure, or Groovy, Goral, there's way more potential to get um, uh, more performance out of it. The main reason why um, you see an improvement with other languages more is, as I said, we tuned for Java. That compiler, we tuned it for Java. So, and it's been around for a long time, but more importantly, that Java code you wrote, you tuned it for C2. Right? You wrote it in a way that it the, runs the fastest on C2, and it's very difficult for a new compiler to come in and be better everywhere. 
right? Especially when the code was written for another compiler. So if you have Scala or whatever at your company or your private pet project or whatever, you should totally run on Graal. I'll give you 100%, I give you 100% that it will run better on Graal than on C2. So since my time's up for a long time, but I had to get this out, we can talk about it more later if you want to. Um, and that was it. Tweet about everything you see today, especially about the party. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs>